past as it relates to preservation, as particularly in the context of the highway issues. And now our next two speakers are going to look more to the future and to the present. Uh, and John Gallery, who, like me, lived through most of what we've just been hearing about, uh, is going to provide a, a status report on preservation and, and progress as it is in Philadelphia now. John? And we'll leave the lights out. Uh, thank you very much. My concern is the issue that Roger just described, and that is, are we still in a situation in which concepts about progress and the preservation of the great architectural heritage of Philadelphia are still in conflict? Or have we moved past that and are we dealing with other and different issues? I think it's important to remember, first off, that I-95 was not the only uh, progressive action that was occurring in the 50s and 60s that had a negative impact on the historic resources of Philadelphia. As Greg already mentioned, there were lots of wonderful 19th century houses in Society Hill that were demolished as part of that project, which we tend to forget in our appreciation for what was accomplished in Society Hill. But this was true of almost every one of the major projects that were undertaken in that period and almost everything that was funded by urban renewal. A great many important buildings were lost in the construction of the National Park, including uh, some great banks by Frank Furness. A great many cast iron buildings were lost in the multi-block demolition for Independence Mall and properties for uh, the expansion of the University of Pennsylvania and many, many other places. Um, it's hard to look back on that era for me and not acknowledge that, well, I was part of that myself. Um, here on the uh, left-hand part of the screen is the Reading Terminal. And when I came to Philadelphia to work at the City Planning Commission, my first project was working on the Market East project. And I was told by my superiors, well, when the commuter tunnel was completed, the Reading Terminal and the train shed will be demolished. So just erase those and construct a uh, shopping mall linking Wanamaker's and Strawbridge's and Clothia's. And I, a uh, recent graduate and not very knowledgeable about preservation or even planning at that point, took my eraser and I blithely erased those buildings and went on planning. Um, there was no hesitation in thinking that those marvelous buildings should be demolished in favor of progress. And well, in a moment I'll say I think things have changed. I would also just like to point out the building on the right, which is the Girard building on South 12th Street, right across from PSFS building. Most people are not aware that the owner of this property, the Board of City Trusts, um, applied for and successfully received a demolition permit for this building only three or four years ago. And this building to me is one of the most important buildings in Philadelphia. It is the most intact example of the early skyscrapers at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and it is a magnificent building. And yet this demolition permit was issued because someone thought they might sometime in the future develop the block between 11th and 12th Street, having no tenants, having no financing, but nonetheless uh, deciding that they would demolish this building. Um, I did wait a short period of time until the developers realized there was no project there, um, submitted a nomination to the Historical Commission, had the building listed on the Philadelphia Register so as not to face this folly again in the future. But I think we also have to recognize that in the 50 years that have passed, a great deal has changed about preservation. And many, many things have been saved and preserved in a marvelous way. We have to be really proud about what has happened. Uh, two buildings that for years were sort of the poster children of neglected buildings in Philadelphia, the Victory Building and the Naval Home, have both been restored, the Naval Home 
is the center of a extensive residential development in that section of South Philadelphia. Preservation has been uh, one of the key economic development generators in Philadelphia. Uh, all of the development that began at the Navy Yard with Urban Outfitters and others was based on restoring historic buildings. And most people aren't aware that 75% of all of the new housing units that have been created in and around Center City that have fueled the population growth of Center City were created by the conversion of historic buildings. Uh, we also can think about uh, all of the hotels who, that serve the convention center and historic buildings, places like the Please Touch Museum. There's been a tremendous amount of investment in historic structures. Uh, a few years ago, I documented this with the help of Econsult Corporation and show that in 10 years, over six and a half billion dollars had been invested in real estate development of historic properties in Philadelphia, producing a lot of taxes and a lot of jobs for the city. You would think that those numbers and the obvious presence of those rehabilitated buildings would create a groundswell of support for historic preservation in Philadelphia. But it doesn't, and I'll speak to that in a minute. And we still have many problems. And I thought it was appropriate for me to label these next two photographs as, you know, what keeps me awake at night? Well, some things really do bother me, and I worry. The Divine Lorraine, which you might be able to see some of the graffiti that covers this building, is a magnificent building. It's had a whole lot of small fires from homeless people sleeping in it. And it is sort of sitting there, and every day I wake up to wonder whether or not it's still going to be there. I've spent nearly 10 years trying to do something with the Boy Theater, and I haven't given up yet, but I haven't succeeded either. So there are still some very major challenges that are before us. But the bigger question is, why does it feel like a struggle? And I have to tell you that doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, it still feels like a struggle. We did an online survey during the summer and asked our members and the general public, what do you think were the primary obstacles today to preservation? And the three responses we got were insufficient funding, which is an obvious thing and a perennial thing. But the other was lack of public support and lack of support from elected officials. We also asked people what they thought were the top issues and how could preservation most contribute to Philadelphia's future. And it was interesting to me that the condition of residential neighborhoods outside Center City was the top issue by far in everyone's mind and the area in which they felt preservation had the most to contribute. The other top issue uh, has been the impact of new development on residential neighborhoods, something that has been a continuing problem even, even in the present time. It's interesting to look at these issues to understand some of the problems. The impact of new development has been something that almost every community group, particularly those in historic districts, have fought in recent years. Developers want to build things that are big because they want to make money. Architects, and I apologize to all the architects in the room, want to design things that are flashy, different, and grotesquely out of context with their <laughs> historic surroundings. Glass, to me, is like the material I would most like to go away. Um, there is this theory that architects have that glass buildings disappear into the sky and you don't even notice them, something which I find not quite to be true. Um, but there are tremendous conflicts, and almost every one of these projects has been opposed by the communities in which they've been located often successfully, sometimes not always, but it is a continuing problem and it just isn't a problem with respect to big buildings in center city neighborhoods. These are two photographs of houses being built in the Point Breeze neighborhood, a neighborhood that is blocks and blocks and blocks of very handsome two-story row houses in which developers are now inserting these three-story boxes because that's the way they can make the most profit in developing one of these vacant lots, much to the consternation of many people in the neighborhood. So the impact of development 
is something that is still of great concern. And it's something that is hard to address because the public sector uh, views new as progress. And therefore, there's a great deal of encouragement to, for people to build new. And I think we are fortunate that we have lots of these small developers doing new development in neighborhoods. That's not the issue. The issue is whether we're going to do it in a way that is sympathetic to the character of neighborhoods so that we're building an environment. We're not just building some marketable products. But the bigger issue is really the deteriorating housing inventory of our city. The house on the left is the house of John Coltrane. It is listed as a, on the National Register. It's a national historic landmark. It's vacant and falling apart, and no one really cares. Uh, the house next to it is vacant as well. I think that 90% of every porch in Philadelphia is falling apart, um, and you see that all over the city. And these are not houses that are vacant. These are houses that are occupied. This magnificent block of houses in North Philadelphia was half vacant and half occupied. Uh, finally, after many years, the Redevelopment Authority did get a developer to rehab them. But the problem was with the remaining houses, where people with low incomes were living who simply couldn't find ways to maintain these properties. Uh, we had a program that has given some grants to these, but this is an issue throughout the city. The biggest issue, the biggest housing issue in Philadelphia is not what to do with vacant houses. It is the need to reinvest in the existing occupied housing stock. And that is in conflict very much with the policies we've been following for many years. We're very concerned with vacant lots. We're very concerned with demolishing vacant houses. Um, and instead, once we have those demolished, once we have those lots, then we want to build on them because new is progress. And so we're building these characterless environments while we are, at the same time, not even bothering to invest in the neighborhoods that have character. And they are reinforcing. The population of neighborhoods outside the center city is declining. Every time you build a new house, in theory, someone moves out of the old house, the old house becomes vacant, the vacant house becomes demolished. It's a cycle in which we're not intervening. But there is another issue that's related to this whole system of declining population, and that is this, its impact on institutions. The school district has announced that it intends to close perhaps 50 schools. They will probably all be historic buildings. Fortunately, schools are often easy to convert. But buildings that are hard to convert are churches. And some of you may be aware of the great struggle going on related to Church of the Assumption. But believe me, that is, as I say here, only the tip of the iceberg. Over the next decade, I couldn't even guess the number of churches that are going to be abandoned. This is a church which is totally abandoned, was sold off by the archdiocese to someone who's totally disappeared. It's vacant. One no one even knows how to get in touch with the current owner. This church on Norris Square is about to be demolished, being the demolition being paid for by the city. Uh, the number of vacant churches, I could have put up 20 slides here of churches that are vacant that the owners, the congregations don't know what to do with, and that could go on endlessly. So what are the problems? I don't think the problem is a conflict between progress and preservation, except in some limited instances, mainly in Center City. But the real problems, the problems which make it so difficult to address preservation in a broad sense at the moment are, I think, these. One is poverty. We have a vast collection of really magnificent residential properties. In most cases, the owners of which are simply do not have the incomes to be able to maintain them. Our grant program over the last few years put $1.7 million into grants for the restoration of historic owner-occupied properties with a limit of about $25,000 per property, doing it in a responsive preservation manner. Um, and often we could not deal even with just the exterior issues for $25,000. Um, this is a tremendous problem, and I think we need to really address 
the issue of preserving the existing occupied housing stock that we have more seriously. I think there is a conflict with this whole notion that we need to build on vacant land rather than preserve the stock that we have, and I'm very pleased to see in the Planning Commission's 2035 citywide vision a statement that established an objective of the city to redirect a lot of the block grant funding from new construction to rehabilitation. We have a declining population, which as I said, is going to undermine institutional buildings such as schools and churches, and I think churches are going to emerge as one of the biggest preservation issues because the churches we have are so grand, so magnificent architecturally, so difficult to reuse, so expensive, and we're gonna see many, 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 many more of them closing. We have to do something about developers who are just in it for the buck, who are just insensitive to the context in which they're working. Uh, how to do that, I think, is a real challenge. We have a lack of funding. Well, that's always true, but right now it's even worse. The Obama administration eliminated federal money for preservation. State has eliminated most federal grants. The city never really put much into preservation. Um, but what little it did put into things like staffing the historical commission is also being squashed and cut, in, and it's a very difficult situation, and developers are hard to press to find private financing. And there is still a difficulty in really getting broad public support, and I think one of the reasons why we have weak support among elected officials is they just don't see it as a primary issue for their constituents. Now, all of that seems pretty bleak, and it is. I think it is a real struggle. But at the same time, there are you know, bright lights even in this era. If you look right around the corner here, we see the Lafayette building under construction for a new hotel conversion of a historic property. If you went up to 12th and Chestnut Street, you'd see the Commonwealth Building under construction, conversion to apartments, and shortly the Robert Morris Building opposite the Comcast Center will be under construction for conversion to apartments. In this particular economy, the access to the federal investment tax credits that gives people 20% of their financing makes historic preservation a lot more economically feasible than new construction. And I think we need to remember that. We need to try to induce the opportunities to provide access to that tax credits, and we have to make sure that Congress doesn't have that on their list of things to cut. It is a challenging environment, but I think we can look back on the past decades in Philadelphia and see tremendous accomplishments. And if we can realize that preservation is a fundable, fundamental part of the economy of Philadelphia. It is not just the preserving of things that look pretty. It is part of our economy, and if we see it in those sense, then hopefully we will build a broader base of support. Thank you. Thank you, John. We've made Susanna wait through all of these talks, and she is going to return back to the highway question uh, with, with some comments on the, the preservation in the context of the highway. Suzanne. Okay, yes, I'll take you back to uh, I-95, and um, I wanted to address, I guess, uh, the, that any assessment of the tension between preservation and, and progress should take into account the historic and present day contexts within which roads are planned and decisions are made. Um, after World War II, the American dream was a house in Levittown, not a townhouse in downtown. Uh, the suburbs bloomed and urban, the urban core fell into decay. The planning and construction of I-95 in Philadelphia and elsewhere occurred at a time when legislation and funding streams favored an assault on cities in the name of urban renewal, as we've heard. The Interstate Highway Act of 1956 established a legislative framework that supported trucking and automobile-centric travel, and therefore road building. All of these forces and others contributed to the loss of historic resources when I-95 cut through Philadelphia's historic core. The results of urban renewal could and can still be seen, not just in Philadelphia, but in many American cities. 
Um, I've put uh, arrows here so you can see kind of before and after views. Uh, many of you may recognize Albany here, kind of be before and after. It's striking, isn't it? And uh, Buffalo, another example. And uh, I did two buildings because the next view is kind of from the opposite direction. So relevant to our discussion here in this regard is the source of funds for I-95 and many similar projects which relied upon large amounts of federal funding already mentioned, really unheard of in our present day context, although I think Obama's gonna try again. Uh, the federal government paid 90% of the cost of I-95 and the uh, states, it went of course all the way from Florida to Maine along the East Coast. Um, the gov federal government paid 90% and the states chipped in the other 10%. So this was clearly a real federal commitment to the destruction of, uh, of clearing land and certainly the destruction of historic resources, perhaps not intentionally, but certainly in consequence. Attempts were made to mitigate the loss of historic resources through documentation at the time when I-95 was going in. Uh, research, archeology, span and measured drawings. Another group that was, has not been mentioned yet was the Historic Salvage Council, which was a partnership between the Philadelphia Historical Commission and the University of Pennsylvania. And it was established as early as 1964 for the purpose of documenting historic sites before they were lost to demolition. In fact, I think uh, as Greg has already mentioned, the Federal Aid Highway and Highway Revenue Act of 1956 provided for archeological and paleontological salvage. And archeological and paleontological survey was intended to be uh, supported by the federal government, again, with this 90-10% split with the states. Um, a cooperative agreement was, in fact, established between the National Park Service and the Pennsylvania Department of Highways and the Historic Salvage Council. Buildings were documented and some archeology span was performed, but the agreement was apparently never fully honored and the council's efforts were eventually aborted. Uh, some of these documents, happily, have survived uh, in the Athenaeum archives and at Penn. With the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, the federal government at last acknowledged that, quote, historic properties significant to the nation's heritage are being lost or substantially altered, often inadvertently with increased frequency. And that, quote, the preservation of this irreplaceable heritage is in the public interest so that its vital legacy of cultural, educational, aesthetic, inspirational, economic, and energy benefits will be maintained and enriched for future generations of Americans. I'm impressed that they got all of those in there. The National Historic Preservation Act, again, created a new legislative framework and one that with which we're so familiar today. The National Register of Historic Places, State Historic Preservation Offices, and particularly relevant to our discussion today, the Section 106 review process. Uh, for those of you who may, who may not be familiar with it, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act states, and I'm quoting again, any federal agency having direct or indi indirect jurisdiction over proposed federal or federally assisted undertaking shall, prior to the approval of the expenditure of any federal funds on the undertaking, take into account the effect of the undertaking on any di district, site, building, structure, or object that is included in or eligible for inclusion in the National Register. We call this simply the Section 106 process, and it does require federal agencies to take into account the effects of their undertaking on historic resources, and those that receive federal funds are also subject to the Section 106 review. Um, and again, I quote that it, uh, the Section 106 process seeks to accommodate historic preservation concerns with the needs of federal undertakings through consultation among the agency official and other parties with an interest in the effects of the undertaking on historic properties. So the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 and the Section 106 review process in particular gave something preservationists that they really hadn't had before, and that was a seat at the table which was pretty significant. So now we'll go back to I-95. Um, as Roger mentioned, KSK, my firm, has been involved with I-95 um, since it went in, and these are just uh, two designs that were done for the areas that cover over the expressway here at uh, Market Street, um, a pedestrian and vehicular walk uh, pathway, and then the um, just uh, pedestrian walkway at South Street. 
the intention being, again, to try to improve these connections from the city to the waterfront. Since 2010, KSK has been working with the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation's long-term multi-phase initiative to improve and rebuild I-95 in Philadelphia. So I'm, I'm sorry, Greg, but they've gone ahead and, and started that. What's different this time around is interesting. Just to show you, um, this is their site, revive.com, and uh, you can find out everything you need to know, and you can see here, um, this project is in several phases here along the side. And here you can get you know, your community. Any, any project that's happening on I-95 or on a, a federal road has a huge public involvement component now. And that seems to be pretty typical. And Philadelphia has made a really a grand effort at this. Um, so you can find out about current construction, uh, completed improvements, scheduled improvements, and of course the public meeting schedule. Which I think, uh, I want to just, if uh, none of you are familiar with it, this is the area of work right now. And although there's only one here, this is uh, the connection to Penn Treaty Park, obviously. Um, but a, a big part of this effort now, which is largely just a reconstruction and repair of ex existing infrastructure, although not entirely, uh, but a big part of the effort is trying to connect neighborhoods on this side of the road to the river. Um, so one of the greatest tragedies, obviously, of I-95 was not just the loss of historic resources, but the separation of Philadelphia neighborhoods from the riverfront. Um, to remedy this, Philadelphia is finally starting to do something. So Philadelphians were engaged in a year-long quote, civic vision for the central Delaware, which was run by Penn Praxis. And the final report was the result of, again, intense civic engagement and thinking about the future of the Delaware Riverfront in addressing transportation, commerce, uh, recreation, housing, and other development. Interestingly, PennDOT, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, was a partner and was very involved in this process. Um, and while I-95 will remain, as I say, with the a current project, PennDOT is working hard to engage communities and to reconnect to the, to the, excuse me, reconnect neighborhoods to the waterfront. And here's just an example of all of the public meetings that you can attend and participate in. Um, that's something, just by the by, that KSK has been very involved with, in, in particular, is this uh, public participation process. And the stakeholders are invited to participate in the design of planned open space along the I-95 corridor and the interpretation of neighborhood history and cultural identity through signage and the incorporation of lighting, artwork, iconography, and similar things on the inevitable retaining walls and underpasses that the roadway requires. Another benefit that uh, this project has had is that, <coughs> excuse me, Archaeologists have been given a major role in the current project, and in spite of all the construction that has preceded them, they are making incredible finds. Not only are they digging and discovering in all of the areas impacted by construction, but they have been encouraged to open their digs to the public and to share their findings in public forums and exhibits. Um, anecdotally, I was told that um, when work um, at the, for the, um, when other archaeological work has been done, in the uh, old city previous to this, archeologists were really kind of, they were allowed to do what they had to do, but they were never encouraged to really display their work or get the public involved. And that, that's been a real change this time around. And here you see, um, I have an historic image up here of the Aramingo Canal. And here you can see, this is uh, part of the, the base of the, the bridge over the canal that was uncovered and this, these posts um, are part of a, um, a pier of some sort. And these are just some examples of the types of things that they've been finding. It's, it's been extraordinary. Uh, one notable loss, though, since this are, is about preservation progress and where we are, um, one notable loss on the historic landscape through this I-95 project is the loss of uh, the William Cramp and Son Ship and Engine Building Company, the machine shop number two, which is the last surviving building. And here you can see uh, the Cramp building is here. 
and unfortunately it was, it's been demolished uh, for an interchange. So shades of the first 95 going in. Um, the Cramp Shipbuilding was established uh, by William Cramp in 1830. They were a major shipbuilder. This is the building. Actually, let me just take you through. This is the exterior of the building. Any of you who have traveled 95, I'm sure, have noticed it on the, uh, the river side. It's a huge building. This was the interior. And these are just some historic images. I'm sorry if I'm going quickly, but I'm sure everybody's ready to get into this. Um, so just a quick history, um, it was, Cramp Shipbuilding was established by William Cramp in 1830. Uh, they were a major shipbuilder in Philadelphia, builder of the battleships USS Indiana and USS Massachusetts, the armored cruiser USS New York and the USS Columbia. William's son, Charles Cramp, managed the company's transition from wooden shipbuilding to iron and steel hull construction and Cramp built the hull for the steam frigate New Ironsides, one of the North's premier ironclads. In 1895, the shipyard covered 32 acres and employed 6,000. Uh, the building, the shipyard went idle in 1927, but like many industrial uh, ventures, was reactivated by the Navy in 1940 for emergency war production of submarines, cruisers, and other vessels. And at that time, it employed 10,000 men and up until war's end. Cramp shipbuilding closed permanently after the war ended, and the site was later occupied by an industrial park. To PennDOT's credit, preserving some portions of the last remaining building of the Cramp shipyard was actually considered, although eventually rejected, as infeasible. Mitig mitigation has included removal of artifacts from the building, which would be made available to local artists for public art or incorporated into interpretive materials that will be displayed in neighborhoods and along the I-95 pedestrian corridor. Um, there were, as you can imagine, a lot of uh, um, of course, now I brought it up. I can't think of what they're called. The uh, things that go along the, uh, nah, forget. What? No, it's a, uh, you had to lift things up. Cranes, many cranes in the building, thank you. Well done, you get a free copy of my uh, signed, <laughs> my signed manuscript. Um, so there, is, there wasn't really that much left in the building, but they're going to, um, they're, they have taken out as much as they can, and they are engaging artists, which I think is, is something. Um, but still, you know, here at last is perhaps the tension between preservation and progress, which was promised in the title of this session. While PennDOT has been more responsive to historic resources during the current roadway improvement effort, the fact remains that a major historic landmark has been lost to a new highway interchange. The loss of the cramped building perhaps then embodies the tension between preservation and progress that still exists today. While the public and preservation professionals are now engaged rather than ignored, mitigation, and mitigation efforts are employed, resources continue to be lost. Um, this is not just happening in Philadelphia. I just wanted to show you another example. Um, and I don't have a photograph, I'm sorry, of the Yale Boathouse, but this is, um, it's interesting on, the, on their website, um, the, new, the uh, Connecticut DOT tells you what's been demolished, but it also gives you a history, which I think is kind of interesting from an information and education point of view. Um, but still, this Peabody and Stearns building was torn down for a bridge. So is this tension or is this the reality of what is still our automotive-centric culture? It's unlikely that another I-95 will be proposed and more likely that we will be, that we will see, excuse me, more projects like the current one with minimal losses to our built heritage. Indeed, many of these roadways now have achieved National Register status. Uh, the New Jersey Turnpike is on the National Register. So maybe we'll have to be preserving roads instead of talking about getting rid of them. Uh, the question now, I think, may be how long will our dependence continue and, how, and will we be discussing these same issues around the construction of, uh, of railways and rapid bus transit systems in the next 5, 10, or 20 years? And it, it, as a side note, it just occurred to me as we were, I was sitting here continuing to think about this, um, now all the, uh, all the railway lines, right, are now converted to 
paths, you know, for bikes, for walkers. There's the High Line in New York. We're going to plant the uh, elevated railway here in Philadelphia. So where are we going to go when we start thinking again about public transportation? So the future may be interesting. Thank you. We do have uh, a few minutes left of our allotted time. And so any of you who have questions, you could di direct to either specifically to one of the speakers or to the group for comment from the floor. I don't know if I should direct this to anyone individual or to the whole panel, but I was wondering what you think the uh, potential for um, the Virgin and Sustainability Movement to affect this uh, conflict that you're discussing today, because it seems to me that there's a, a lot of um, weight on the side of preservation to come from uh, sustainable approaches to you know, not demolishing buildings that we can't re uh, build again and that sort of thing. Uh, I'll take the first shot at that, uh, but I welcome the uh, rebuttal from the floor. I think, and I, I think it comes out of uh, teaching and being around uh, the next generation of professionals. I think that preservation has tried to connect with the sustainability, sustainability movement, uh, but to my mind it has not really stuck as well as it should yet. Um, but I really think that the next, I think that we'll see more of it in the next generation because there's a lot more um, students in school now, architects, landscape architects, preservationists, they're all working together so much more, I think, than we did in my generation. And, and that's what I see as the future. If I would add to that, I would say that sustainability, and, and please you understand that I'm a little bit cynical about this. Um, sustainability is putting a green roof on a new building. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is today. You look around and yes, maybe there's some more insulation in the walls, but the things that everyone hypes is it's a green roof on a new building. Um, until you get to the point of being able to sort of look at this exotic, uh, you know, calculation of what is the total energy consumption uh, between demolishing, sending things to landfills, and building new buildings, you still don't get preservation coming up on the winning side of things. And you can do flashier, again, it's my sort of man mantra, you know, progress means new. You can see sustainability in a new building and a green roof and a this and a that. If you do something in a historic building that improves its insulation, improves its efficiency and things like that, you don't see it, and that's part of our dilemma, I think, is that we want to see these sort of visible things that we can point to, and that means progress. But in Philadelphia, I think we have to somehow turn that corner. We have to recognize that progress for Philadelphia is maintaining what is so beautiful and so unique about this city, and that is its architectural character. One of the speakers, I uh, forget which one, mentioned uh, with dismay the policy of the uh, city in demolishing vacant housing in the neighborhoods. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, in neighborhoods which are beginning to decay and are beginning to have large quantities of vacant houses, uh, the residents of those neighborhoods support such a policy, uh, partly because uh, these vacant buildings tend to attract more vacancies and also to be a seen for, uh, for undesirable people and fight their tendency to try to make their neighbors more safe. So I wonder, even though it may not be so elegant, uh, whether the policy is being followed now may not be the correct one. I think I made reference to that. And I think there is a, you know, there's a tremendous difficulty here. There's no question that the vacant buildings that occur throughout many neighbors in the cities are nuisances, they're dangerous, they're um, harmful to the properties they're adjacent to, and many of them need to be demolished. There's no question about that. But back in the days when we, when John Street initiated the Neighborhood Transformation Initiative, in the beginning of that program, 
I spent a lot of time in which I went out with the engineers who were doing the surveys, making decisions about which vacant buildings were going to get demolished. And we'd walk down a block that had whatever, 30 row houses on it, uh, all of which were occupied, and there was one vacant house in the middle of the block, and the engineers would say, demolish. And I would say, I, I think maybe that's worth a second question, you know? So, uh, so I think the dilemma, you know, really on the one hand is, yeah, we need to demolish them, but we need to also be able to think about it. And the NTI program actually became uh, more responsive as time goes on. It, it often encapsulated a building because it was the one on the block and eventually you'd get it, try to get it, um, you know, restored. Um, it, it started to, when it came across historic buildings, it act, there was actually an interdisciplinary task force of city agencies that looked at properties and made decisions about them. So I think we need, do need to do demolition, but I think we need to think about it in the context of what, where, and how. But then the dilemma you have is, okay, what next? Now we have tremendous amounts of vacant land. And the whole sort of underlying theory behind the Neighborhood Transformation Initiative was, we'll tear them down, we'll have vacant land, we'll sell it to developers and nonprofits, and they'll build new. The dilemma of that is that most of the vacant land that you see in Philadelphia is owned by people that we don't even know where they are. It's not owned by the city. When properties were demolished, and still when properties are demolished, they are not acquired. They're owned by some widow in Cleveland. Um, but even if you leave that aside, you know, what is the choice? The choice is, are we putting the subsidy money that we have available into all of the suburban twin house new construction that you see all over the place? And I always like to own up to my guilt. I did the first project of that nature in North Philadelphia. I blame myself for everything that's followed. Um, but we're doing that at the expense of, of looking at places where a strategic investment in existing occupied housing would allow us to, to retain the integrity of these neighborhoods. And we don't have enough resources to do all of those things. That's the dilemma. So I'm not faulting some of the, I mean, I am faulting, but I'm not faulting some of the policies because yes, they are correct ones. The challenge really and particularly now with the much more limited resources, is how do we find some balance between these things? How do we figure out which of the neighborhoods that have enough integrity we really should invest in maintaining the existing stock? And where are the ones in which you have so much vacancy or vacant land that that isn't even an issue, that the issue really is clear out the rest of the bad stuff and figure out a way that we do rebuilding those things. But there needs to be that balance, and we haven't had that balance. The last probably two decades have been really swung towards let's deal with the vacant land, let's deal with the demolition, let's deal with the new construction at the expense of any real investment in the existing infrastructure. Yeah, if I could jump off that actually. You know, in my, my, my actual day job, I run a community development corporation and we're right now restoring a 13,000 square foot building from the 1930s. Uh, we do home repair programs, we do other neighborhood reinvestments. And so the question is, you know, we always look at neighborhoods, okay, this is how it looks now, this is what the residents are thinking about it now. And I think the key that we have to struggle with is how can we make strategic investments, as John was saying, to influence the community's future five, 10 years from now. And I think this is a real block in thinking for a lot of people that if the neighborhood looks run down and has these problems, the solution is to tear things down and start over. Uh, and what actually is is that through the right kind of planning and the right kinds of strategic investments and community empowerment initiatives, you can very quickly uplift a neighborhood uh, you know, without displacing people and create private investment to restore historic houses and, and buildings, as is going on in the neighborhood where I work. So I don't think it's an either or scenario. Uh, I mean, John was talking about a balanced appro approach, but I would even go a step further that it's really critical to look at investing in these historic structures as a way to uplift 
uh, these neighborhoods that are really in devastated conditions because these kinds of things can be anchor developments that change the, uh, the visibility of a neighborhood and the impression of a neighborhood for the whole city. Any uh, success stories of converting for adaptive reuse these big churches in a community for a community center, maybe partners of sacred places, something in Philadelphia that has been a tremendous model as a success story of what can happen to these big churches? It's a good question. I asked that question about three, four months ago myself, and uh, this last summer I funded a study that um, was jointly done by uh, the Preservation Alliance Partners for Sacred Places and the Historical Commission, in which we basically did an inventory of, I think it's 7,000 religious properties in Philadelphia. And one of the things I wanted to find out was what uh, churches had been converted to non-religious uses. There have been lots of things that uh, have been Lutheran churches that are now Buddhist meditation centers or Catholic and are now Korean. Um, I found about, I think it's about 20 examples and I'm not able to remember them all. One of the most interesting is on, in um, West Philadelphia, um, it's on I think Haverford Avenue, probably around 40th Street. And I don't remember the name of the church, but the one reason, one of the reasons why I think it was successful is it consisted of a complex of a very large church a school building and a rectory building. So there were two buildings which were relatively easy to convert to housing. And the church was actually converted to housing as well with dormers inserted in the roof of the church. So the whole complex uh, was converted to housing using, I think, both historic and low income you know, tax credits. Um, I'm trying to manage to figure out how to get this inventory and the results of it uh, up on our website because I think it's the most definitive um, examination of the properties of religious, of the problems of religious properties in the city. And there are some other examples. I mean, there's a um, church out in uh, West Philadelphia that was converted to a theater. Um, so there are a few, but there are not a lot in Philadelphia that we found in going through this this summer. One example I do want to cite, though, and John, you threw in the non-religious, but the original question was for community uses. Uh, and one of my favorite examples of a church that I think is, has really found a way to sustain itself is uh, what's now the Calvary Center at 48th and uh, Baltimore, mm -hmm. which does have religious uses. It has maybe six or seven different congregations that use it, mm -hmm. but it also has several community groups, historical groups that use it. There's a theater that uses it as its space. There's a flea market downstairs. There's yoga and uh, karate classes downstairs. Uh, there's a flea market on the weekends. A huge number of uses use this space for different things. A community meeting one day, a uh, Quaker or a, a Mennonite service another day, a Jewish service another day, while there are other uses in theater going on across the hall and all going on at the same time. And I think it's a wonderful example of a big, how a big church building can be reused as a community center that's both religious and non-religious. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw in an office example because that makes it less feasible for the 22nd adjustment, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was converted to offices. It's got to be, I don't know, everything. I think now everything is 20 years ago. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's um, a great example of, of a church. And, and they the offices are actually in the sanctuary space, so mm -hmm. it's not that they also used an adjacent building, but that's a, another good example. They're, they're out there when you look. I'd like to point out that I live at Pier 3 Condominium, which is not quite what you're talking about, but which is a historic uh, redevelopment of a property in Pier, 3, Pier 5 next door to it at the same time. Interestingly enough, when this was first undertaken in the 1980s, the uh, local developers thought that the, the, the developer of this project was nuts. And as it turns out, the developer lost his shirt. But about 10 years after they were redeveloped, let's say about 19, they, they were meant to be a, uh, condos, but went into apartments soon after they were redeveloped. Uh, in about 10 years later, in the early 90s, they switched from apartments to condos again, and they were sold out within three or four weeks. Um, 
and it's it's a very uh, and Pier Three in particular uh, is a very popular place to be. It's not new. It's 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 actually 25 years old. The the um, refurnishment and so forth and so on. But it's a healthy <coughs> development along the Delaware Riverfront.